Welcome to RIA Advisors. I'm Danny Ratliff, Senior Financial Advisor. Wanted to spend a little bit of time today with you guys discussing the onboarding process. So as the accounts have been set up and they've been fully funded, you've been working with our onboarding team. Now we start to get into the meat of it as far as where do we go from here? So we have with us Lance Roberts, our Chief Investment Strategist, and Michael Leibowitz, our Portfolio Manager, to answer some frequently asked questions about what's next. So Lance and Mike, as we're transitioning to RIA advisors beginning to manage new accounts, it looks a little bit different depending on, number one, what type of an account. Is it a taxable account where we do have to be considerate of capital gains? Or is it pre-tax funds or Roth funds that we don't need to worry about capital gains or trading within the accounts? So let's talk a little bit about what that looks like. Now, obviously, your advisor should be having these conversations with you if there's going to be some capital gains implications to be made as we're moving the accounts into our models. But we're not the all or nothing firm where, you know, once funds hit, we move everything in. So Lance, spend a little bit of time discussing what that looks like from a client perspective and what you guys are doing. So, you know, one of the big challenges that we have in terms of when a new account first comes over is simply going, okay, how do we get the account from where we are now into our model on a risk adjusted basis. And a lot of this has to do with where the markets are trading technically in the near term. If markets are very, very overbought short term, then we may wait for a while in order to start buying new positions. Conversely, at the same time, if you've brought over a lot of equity positions into into our shop and you're wanting us to reallocate into our models, we may use that opportunity to start selling stuff, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to buy anything right away. So again, as we look through each position in our model, we then begin to look for opportunistic entry points of getting that capital put to work and getting the portfolio transferred into our models. Importantly, when we're running models, one of the most important things is that how we enter the position. And you know, so if, we, if a position is gonna be 5% of the portfolio, what we may do is buy 1% of the position to start with, see if that trade is gonna work out the way we think it is, or if we really like a stock and it's, under, it's undervalued and it's not performing well, we may buy a very small position into that company just to get a foothold there. And then once it begins to perform better, we add into that. And in some cases, that may mean we are buying that position at lower levels in order to build that value in that company over time. Lance, you mentioned something about you know taking a smaller position in something that may be undervalued, mm -hmm. but sometimes it continues to underperform for a time being. What does it look like from a stop loss perspective? Um, sometimes you may let these smaller positions run a little bit longer than others, correct? Right, yeah. You know, so you know, stop loss rules are very important in managing a portfolio, but it's not a be all end all, particularly when you're trying to build a position over time. Again, when we really like a company and, and the company is very fundamentally undervalued, well, it's probably out of favor in the markets for one reason or the other. Maybe that particular sector is not in favor, or maybe that company is a really good company, but may have some near-term issues that are affecting it that we're not sure exactly how long it's gonna to take to get through that, but we wanna use the opportunity to buy into that company at lower prices should that opportunity occur. Now, if it's a position that is more of a growth oriented company, has a lot of volatility, et cetera, is overvalued, then those stop loss rules become much more important in managing that risk. So if a company starts to sell off, it breaks a, breaks a fundamental stop loss level, then yeah, we'll sell it, remove that position from the portfolio temporarily, raise some cash, and that helps us hedge our risk somewhat. So it really depends on the thesis behind the ownership of what we're buying. Are we buying a position simply for trading purposes to create capital gains in a portfolio? If so, we have very, very tight stop loss rules for that type of position. If we're building a fundamentally value-based long-term holding. This is a company we really like. We're going to be we believe in this company long-term. We want to own it long-term. Well, we're, those stop-loss rules become a little bit more loose. We still have them, but we give it more room to work. So we have an opportunity to not only build into that position over time, but also reap the benefit of long-term growth out of that company. So Mike, how does trading work relative to market conditions and economic activity? So we take a, we, you know, we're studying economic conditions, macroeconomic environment, and trading conditions, what the market's doing, how volatile it is, 
what type of risks lay ahead for the markets and for the economy. And then we base our trading patterns around that. When the market's slowly trending upwards, for instance, we will likely have a large position and stick with it. When the market's volatile, when there's a lot of economic news, when the Fed's in play, when recession odds are going up and down, we may be a little more active. We may be watching our risk. We may have stop losses that take us out of positions sooner. So, so a lot depends on the environment that we're in and how actively we need to trade to both preserve the funds that we have. We want to have stop losses in place as a risk management tool. And then in, in markets that are generally trending higher, we want to be fully positioned to take advantage of those trends and ride them higher. Sounds like there's a little bit more activity than some people may be used to, considering we're not your traditional buy and hold firm. We're also, once funds arrive, we're not just throwing them into the markets. What does that look like from a perspective of getting fully onboarded into the model? How long does that take in general? Um, I'll take that one. Uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, when we're talking about getting people into models, it can take some time. And again, this goes back to where we are in the market. Um, if you think back to a period of time where markets had been just trending higher for quite some time, markets were extremely overbought, they can stay that way for a while. So we're re more reticent in buying into overvalued markets or overextended markets than we are when markets are deeply oversold or undervalued. Uh, so if a market has been trending higher for a period of time, if, if we've been in a period where it's been a bull market for two or three years in a row, it's probably going to take longer to get you into the models. And, and in fact, that could take anywhere from 12 to 18 months because we've got to wait for the positions that we want to buy, whether it's an ETF or whether it's an individual stock. We have to wait for that correction to occur, for that position to sell off a bit, get oversold, and give us an entry point to buy that position in the portfolio and allocate that capital. Now, if the market's in the middle of a bear market, as an example, and, and valuations have been falling and you know asset prices are, are extended to the downside, then that's a very fast process to get you into the portfolio because we're able to buy opportunistically on a very rapid basis. So during kind of that period of time, your onboarding process could be as little as a month to three months. So again, it really depends. And again, this all goes back to talking about risk management and, and, and protection of capital. And this also goes back to, to really this idea of, of, Mike, as you were talking about before, about protection of capital and risk management. You know, the onboarding process of, of getting people into portfolios is, is, is entirely a function of this risk management process and this whole goal of capital preservation because again if, if we go in all at once while markets are very high and again this is the problem with buy and hold investing is that it's like oh just no matter what the market's doing you just put your money into the market that's fine but you may suffer a very long period of time where markets either don't perform or perform poorly where we could be using that period of time as, a, as an opportunistic opportunity to put money to work at lower prices and, and so this is why that, that part of that process of onboarding can take longer than you know, some people might expect, and, and we're slow and patient in that process. And I think it's important to note that it's a process. So when you come on board, we will buy certain positions, and at some point in the future, we will make sure that you are fully loaded on all the positions. But between the beginning and that end point, we will constantly be buying and potentially selling some of the positions bringing some of the positions up to speed. But as we sell out of our portfolio, we are also likely to sell some of those positions that we may have just bought for you if our, our technical or fundamental reasons change. So Mike, we just talked a little bit about what people can expect when onboarding, trading activity, things of that nature. Now we have many different models. And one thing I think that's really important to understand is that as we're moving into models, once we're fully allocated, just because we are more active money managers does not mean that we either get all the way out or all the way in. So while we do have many different allocations and, you know, I pick on 60, 40 models quite a bit, 60% stocks, 40% equities, because that's what most big, big firms have. And we have that model as well. However, we manage that much differently when market conditions are deteriorating, we will reduce exposure. And when they're better, we will add exposure to those areas. So Mike, elaborate a little bit on that as far as what people can expect once the account is fully onboarded. 
that's a great point. We're active managers. So in a, in a perfect market that's just slowly trending higher, we're going to be fully allocated to equities. And within that, there are going to be equities that we think will outperform best, the sectors that we think are primed to do best in whatever sort of trend is rising. Other times, we get more concerned. We concern ourselves with risks and, and losing money, which we don't like to do. So we may reduce exposure. Uh, at times when, when things can get pretty hairy, we may reduce it quite a bit. But we will never reduce fully because it's very important to have a foothold in a market. When things are, are worse is often when it's a great buying opportunity. And we had this in 2020 with the pandemic. Late March, you couldn't have had a worse environment for stocks. The economy was shut down. It wasn't even tanking. It was shut down. But the government was, and the Fed were pouring a ton of liquidity into markets. And at that point in time, when things were the bleakest, that was one of the better points to buy stocks. So it's important. It's much easier to buy stocks when you have stocks ready and you can add to positions. It's much harder when you don't own any, trying to stick that first toe in the water. So we, we try to maintain positions that are not always fully, fully maxed out but never all the way down to zero either. Yeah, that's a great point, Mike, because back in 2008, I experienced this kind of real time, you know, during that whole financial crisis meltdown, everybody was convinced the market was going to zero and that, you know, the world had just ended for the most part. And it was always interesting psychologically speaking at that point, because in, in, in February, we wrote an article talking about this is the best time to start buying stocks. and nobody wanted to own stocks and in fact you know clients were just petrified about having anything any exposure to the markets whatsoever you know and, and it's not always that psychological kind of push that you need to get over the edge to get back into market so by maintaining some exposure and again we maintain maintain a small percentage of equity exposure in portfolio even if it's under pressure um, but we can hedge that also uh, by having a lot of extra cash. We can hedge against those positions using bonds, using a variety of other instruments. But when the market starts to heal up and starts to improve, and you see those asset prices improving, it's then easier psychologically to add to those positions or add new positions versus starting, like Mike said, from starting from zero is a very tough psychological basis to get over and to get back into markets. And this is why, you know, individuals tend to wind up doing exactly the opposite of what they should do. You know, they buy high, they sell low because of psychology. And so our whole management process that we focus on is around not only trying to make the portfolio perform on a risk adjusted basis, but it's also designed to help battle those inherent behavioral biases that, that you have, that Mike and I have, we deal with this just like you do every day. We value your money very much and we treat your money like our own. So it's so the challenges of psychological behaviors impact us as portfolio managers just like they do you. And the one important point is, is that yes, we're active managers, but that doesn't mean we're never going to lose money. Our portfolios will be down because we're always going to maintain some equity exposure during down markets. So if the markets are down 10 percent, you should expect your portfolio to be down two or three percent. If the markets are up 10 percent, you should expect your portfolio to perform eight percent, seven percent, nine percent. It should be in the ballpark of what the market's doing. But because of the fact, A, that we run a 60-40 allocation inherently across the bulk of our models, you're going to have some performance lag on the upside, but you should also inherently receive portfolio outperformance when markets are going down. And over time, that mitigation of downside risk will help your portfolio grow even more than just being allocated to the markets on a buy and hold basis over time. If I could just backtrack to what Lance just said for one second, it's important to note that there are a couple ways we control exposure. We just don't necessarily sell. Sometimes we may sell some volatile stocks that we're not comfortable with and buy some very conservative companies that can do well in bad environments. If you go back, at, you know, look at 2000, small cap, small cap value stocks did very well. Value stocks did very well. So to reduce exposure in 2000, you need, all you had to do was sell tech and buy value. You didn't have to 
whether you reduced it from 60% to 40% to 20% was it as important as what you owned. So there's always a combination of what you own and how much you own in aggregate that we look at. Thank you for the detailed explanation. Now, Lance, you did mention something about the 60-40 model, and I kind of mm -hmm. set this last question up for that. But we do offer many other types of allocations, and none of those are static. We're very active with as far as how we manage that based on the economic conditions. But I want to spend a little bit more time on something Mike mentioned in regard to sectors, types of investments that we would invest in. So maybe let's discuss things that we would not invest in. By a, by a large margin, the majority of our accounts are in our 60-40 allocation. Now, we have, some, we have some varied models around that 60-40 model. There are individuals that are ultra conservative because they're in retirement, they need a set specific rate of income, et cetera. So maybe they have a lot more bonds than they have equities. Maybe they have very little equity exposure. And so we have a portfolio model for that. Um, we also have a portfolio that we use for high net worth investors, which you know, incorporates options to help hedge risk and to create income for those portfolios. So we can take that basic model, but you know, when you think about portfolios and the way we look at portfolios, the 60-40 is basically the car. And we can then adjust that car to tune performance by you know, changing out you know, engine parts or changing out the transmission, whatever it is. We can tune those models to represent what we need in the markets. And, and even our 60-40 model is not static to 60-40. And this is one of the big misnomers I think that people have, not only that work with us, but just in general, is that if you're in a 60-40 model, you're stuck in 60-40. You can only have 60% equities and you can only have 40% bonds and that can't change. And that's absolutely not the case. In varying market environments, and, and we've done this in the past, our equity exposure may go from 60 to 70% equities and 20 or 30% bonds. Uh, in very, very poor environments, that equity exposure may be 35% equities and 65% uh, in bonds and cash. So we tailor that portfolio exposure relative to what the market's doing. So it's not, the, the model is not static, the portfolio is not static, and the management is not static. It's all responsive to what the economy, the markets, the technicals, the fundamentals are all telling us about the market at a particular point in time. Really good point, Lance, but I think most people are accustomed to these static models. That's why mm -hmm. I think these types of conversations are so important to make sure that we're all on the same page, you have a really good understanding. Yeah. Now, that last question was kind of a two-part question. Right. So talk a little bit about the sectors that you would look at, maybe in even asset classes or areas that you would stay away from. Uh, yeah, I think this is when, you know, when Mike and I are, are managing a portfolio, again, we're long-term fundamental investors. And, you know, we, we, we want to buy stocks that are fundamentally cheap. We want to buy companies that are growing earnings. We want to do these things. But we also recognize there's times in, in, the, in the markets where, well, kind of sanity goes out the window. <laughs> and we saw that in 2020 as, you know, $5 trillion worth of stimulus came in the markets. Everybody started speculating in stocks. Uh, you had meme stocks that were going through the roof. That can, Markets can do that. Um, we're still not going to buy those companies. So if you're, you know, if you're coming to us and expect us to buy companies with no earnings, no profit growth, no real, no real business plan to succeed in the future environment, we're not going to put your capital at risk. Because again, when we go back, your capital is just like our capital. We, we value it. We protect it. And yes, we may give up some gains. We may miss those speculative booms in the markets because we won't take on that type of speculative risk, but we will find companies that are participating in that rally and we will add those to our portfolios. And again, we may buy companies in our portfolio that are not fundamentally cheap, right? Uh, we've owned companies that are trading at high, high price to sales ratios, but they have incredibly strong growth paths in, in terms of earnings and their business model and the sectors that they're involved in. Um, but we don't buy companies that are extremely speculative that don't have what Warren Buffett would call a, you know, a moat or a barrier to entry where they can sustain that type of growth over time. Mike? I, I think what's most important is we invest. Yeah. We don't speculate. We don't play roulette with your money. Lance and Mike, thank you so much for the in-depth conversation here. So with all the information that's out there and this current environment, everybody wants some type of level of touch and understanding as far as what's going on. And so at RIA Advisors, we think that, you know, this relationship is extremely important. We're helping you with your livelihood. You guys have worked really hard to get to where you are. 
We want to ensure that you guys are empowered with information, the knowledge to be confident as far as what's going on. And we send a lot of information out. Lance, Mike, let's talk a little bit about that relationship and what the responsibilities are on both sides. Yeah, I, th I think this is a good point because, you know, two things occur normally when, when I talk to individuals about their previous experience with advisors. Like, well, I never heard from my advisor. I never knew what was going on. I didn't understand anything. And, you know, Mike and myself in particular, we do a tremendous amount of work every day. Uh, to make sure that you're informed about what's going on. But you have to have the responsibility. Again, we can provide you the information, but it's your responsibility as a client to stay informed. We publish our research on a daily basis. If you ever have a question about why we bought or sold something, there is something on our website that we've published within the last few days that will explain what our thinking is. So there's no reason for you to ever think that you don't have access to information. We publish a daily market commentary that we email you to every morning. If you, you have to subscribe to these things, we don't force feed you, but we make it available for you. But we have a daily market commentary. It's about a three minute read. Mike writes the big chunk of that. I had a few little comments about daily trading updates into that. But that's every morning at 7.30 before the market opens, you're gonna know what we're thinking and what's going on with the markets and your money. We write a weekly newsletter that we email to you on Monday mornings with a little note from the firm saying, hey, here's our latest transactions. This is what we've been doing for you. On Tuesday, we send you our technical market update. So you have that available. We email that exclusively to you. On our website, of course, you can get our daily podcast that we do, our Real Investment Show podcast, three minutes on markets and money. It's called Before the Bell Now. And again, Mike writes articles on every Wednesday that we post on our website. We have a blog that's also posted on Tuesdays and Fridays. So again, there's absolutely no reason for you as a client not to have access to information. And the stuff that we publish is our research. We actually just publish our research for everybody. It holds us accountable for what we're doing in your portfolio. So when you read something and you don't see it in your portfolio, that's the accountability, right? That's when you email your advisor and say, hey, Mike and Lance said this, but I didn't see it in my portfolio. Why not? And we can fix that if that occurs. But this is the important thing is that we feed you a lot of information, but your responsibility as a, as a client and to make the relationship strong between us as your portfolio managers, between your advisor, and to make sure that you're engaged into what's happening with your money because it's so important, you have to take the opportunity to read what we provide, to watch the videos that we produce. I'm not saying all of them. We provide so much of it, it's a fire hose. But you know, some of it is, is at least keeping you informed and engaged as to what's happening, Mike. Yeah, we spend a lot of time on our articles, our podcasts, and it's to serve you, to give you the information you need, but it also in the process, Lance and I either gain more conviction about our economic views, about the stocks that we hold, or it, we start wavering. Maybe we're wrong, you know, we're doing more research. So, so these are, are tools that help us and help you and most importantly, help you understand what we're thinking. Our investment committee meets four times a week and everybody in the firm is involved. So it's a very in-depth process, but really what a lot of this information is, is actually meeting minutes, things that the portfolio managers are looking at, the investment committee as a whole, the advisors are on these calls so they understand exactly what's going on. They have a seat at the table to make sure that you know, your interests are being looked after the proper way uh, because everybody's on the same page. So. This works really, really well. Now, I know, like Lance just mentioned, he mentioned we can really drink out of a fire hose here. There's a ton of information. If, you know, as an advisor, the one thing that I would prefer you read, if you're going to read anything, because I know a lot of people say, hey, we hired you, so we don't have to go through all this information and research. And I get it. But if you read anything, look at your confirmations and look at the Monday client update, because that's going to give you a really good idea as far as what happened the prior week and what we're anticipating the following week or upcoming week. Lots of information. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for your trust. Uh, we know this is a relationship. Obviously, questions, thoughts, concerns, please reach out to your advisor. We're always happy to answer any questions, and we look forward to a, uh, a great, successful relationship with each one of you. Thank you.